Morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to Cardiology Grand Rounds. I am really excited today to introduce our uh, visiting professor, Dr. Jonathan Menachem, who is an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at Vanderbilt in cardiology. So Jonathan did his undergraduate training in Duke and then got his MD at Tulane and then went back to Duke for his uh, medicine training. He went to Penn for his cardiovascular fellowship and then during his final year at Penn, he really did an intensive deep dive into the field of adult congenital heart disease, working with some of the luminaries in the field to, to get his uh, ACHD training. Following that, he stayed on for an advanced heart failure fellowship and transplantation. After graduating from his training, Jonathan moved to uh, Nashville to join the faculty at Vanderbilt, where he's really been a national leader in the field of advanced therapies and heart failure management and transplantation for adults with congenital heart disease. So he serves as the director of a really exciting center. I'm hoping to learn more about the Advanced Congenital Cardiac Therapies Group at Vanderbilt, and they work on standardizing protocols and treatment strategies for adults with congenital heart disease. And he led, leads a collaborative effort for heart liver transplant in Fontan patients. So overall, this is really one of the most vexing problems facing adult congenital heart disease doctors today is um, how to manage this very high risk population and when to, uh, when to make that shift towards advanced therapies. It's a field that's still uh, formulating and Jonathan is without a doubt a national leader in terms of directing us in, in how we ought to be doing that. Um, he's got a number of national leadership positions. In addition to his reputation, he is on the Medical Advisory Board of the Adult Congenital Heart Association. He's published dozens and dozens of articles in Jack and Jack Heart Failure and JAMA Cardiology and a lot of other premier journals. He seems to spend a lot of time traveling around the country talking, looking at his national speaking profile, uh, which is quite impressive, uh, particularly over the last few years. And today he'll be talking to us about advanced therapies for adults with congenital heart disease. So thank you very much for making the trip out here and it's a delight to have you. Um, one last plug, this afternoon from one to three, we're going to be holding a round table uh, where we'll be using a couple cases as springboard to talk about some of the nuanced challenges in how to manage uh, heart failure patients with congenital heart disease with a real focus on Fontan transplant and getting the Vanderbilt perspective, which has obviously been a, been a national leader in transplantation, congenital heart disease transplantation. So uh, I think most people should have that information, but if you're able to join, we would love to have people. It's in person and Zoom in this building. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Eric. You want, you want your problem? You, you got to make it through this talk. Uh, well, thanks for having me. I um, That was a really nice introduction. I mean, I think that a lot of this, I call this the humbling sport of advanced therapies because, it. I mean, we've done, a, we've done some stuff at Vanderbilt, but the truth is we still don't really know exactly what we're doing. So that's what we're working on. Um, doesn't want to let me... Um, advance here. Maybe the shortest grand rounds of all time. <laughs> These are my disclosures. So I'll just tell you a little bit about my journey. I grew up in New York. Um, I went to Duke. I did investment banking before, which is why I like to fight with administrators before med school. I worked um, for a medical device company in San Francisco. And there I I read this amazing book called A Walk on Water, which if you haven't read it, is phenomenal, all about the, the switch to the arterial switch operation that was done by Roger Mee at the Cleveland Clinic. I then went to Tulane Medical School, and I got to do my pediatric time at Ochsner, who Doug Moody, who many of you know, was there. And he told me, you have to go spend some time with Wendy Book and Mike McConnell at Emory. And this was sort of what sort of changed my trajectory, because I didn't know anything about adults with congenital heart disease. I thought it was a pediatric problem. So as many of you know, Wendy has been a revolutionary person in terms of treating advanced therapies for adults with congenital heart disease. I went to Duke, then I went to Penn, where I did this combined fellowship, which now, you, well, you can still do it, but you'll be 90 when you get done. But in four years, I did two years of general cardiology. I did an adult congenital year, and then I did heart failure transplant. And it was there that Mary L. Jessup told me that she said, you know, 
there's people in ACHD that know about heart failure and, and transplant, but there's, there's really nobody in heart failure and transplant that focuses on ACHD and you should try that. And for those of you that know Mariel Jessup, you don't tell her no. So I did exactly what she told me and then I wound up at Vanderbilt. I do want to just start back just a little bit, just for one second. I'm from New York and I, and I, I think most of you know that your director is also from New York. It turns out that when my parents moved back to Nashville, they found all my old yearbooks. And look who showed up. So where the wild things are, the not only, not only, what an adorable little kid. The, uh, not only uh, was he a fan of where the wild things are. Uh, Karen, are you going to take a picture? Is that what you're... <laughs> But it turns out he was really into the can-can. I don't know what this was about. but uh, So um, we'll go ahead and let the wild rumpus start. So let me just tell you a little bit about, the, about congenital heart disease for those of you that don't focus on congenital heart disease. I like to start with this, what they said in Osler's textbook. It was pretty much congenital heart disease was, they gave it four pages and it pretty much said that everybody dies and there's nothing to do and just move on. And now if you look, congenital heart disease is the fastest growing segment in adult cardiology. Many of you have seen this slide multiple times. So there's 20,000 new patients per year. But the problem is the number one cause of death for most of these patients is heart failure. And very few of them are undergoing transplant. I mean, if you look at this, it looks like there's growth, but the actual, the percentages of total transplants is quite low. So when I got to Vanderbilt, so... I got there because Mariel Jessup's closest friend, Joanne Lindenfeld, runs the group at Vanderbilt. And Joanne said, we have an opportunity to really change the way we're doing things. So let's, you know, make some goals and figure out how we're going to do this. So when I first got to Vanderbilt, in the five years before I got there, there were only two adults with congenital heart disease that underwent transplant. So we said, this seems ridiculous, especially since we're attached to a large children's hospital. So we set out some goals, what we were going to do. First, we were going to figure out how to find the patients that had congenital heart disease that needed advanced therapies. Then we're going to figure out how to grow our research efforts. This is something that I was not super savvy on. I am not a researcher by any stretch. Joanne is. But Joanne said that research is how we're going to get people to listen to what we're doing. And it's also how we're going to figure out how to uh, collaborate with a number of centers and people around the country. And then we got to focus on improving patient care. So just starting at the top with how we found the patients and improving care. So we're here in Tennessee, and we thought that all of the patients that we would get to evaluate for, that had heart failure would all come from within the Vanderbilt system. And it turns out that we're getting patients lucky for having you guys and, and OHSU, like we don't have to deal with the West, but we're getting all of these patients uh, from around the country that need advanced uh, advanced therapies. We've had this year about one third of our transplant evaluations have been adults with congenital heart disease. Now they all don't get transplanted, but so about a hundred, we're getting about two patients per week that are being sent for, uh, for therapy. So that was, <clears throat> that was sort of surprising how fast the, the patients started to come. And then we said, well, how are we going to improve care? So first thing we decided was, well, let's not, we're just not going to believe the hype and what people tell us. Cause we know that, that mortality is, is really bad in hospital for transplanting Fontans, right? If you look, um, and this was done by Gabe Hernandez, who's now at university of Mississippi. So we said, well, that can't be, that's not always right. It's being done in the wrong places. And so we're going to do it better um, because we know that, that, high volume centers have better outcomes, right? So when we looked at the UNOS data, those centers that had transplanted more than 14 patients per year, their outcomes for congenital heart transplants were significantly better. Now that's not 14 congenital transplants, that's all transplants. So we sort of went into it thinking like, well, all right, we're, we've got a pretty solid size, you know, center, this should be good. And then we also know, um, um, that this is what you guys did, right? That it turns out that if you involve congenital people in the evaluation process, patients do better. So we had that sort of set up. So we just figured that, okay, let's just go for it and see what happens. And, and our start was a little rough. And 
we, it's amazing how you can learn so much from one patient. So this was James, who was a 22 year old uh, hypoplast who had cirrhosis and PLE and the whole thing. And we transplanted him and it was a disaster. And it was a disaster right from the get-go. And we sort of realized like, okay, we got to rethink all of this. Like, not just that we have the people that can do this, but was he too sick? What did we do wrong in the operating room? How do we manage him pre-op? And I think he really drove a lot of what we were, what we do now um, in terms of how we manage these patients. But we did, we did learn a lot, not only medically, but one of the main things that we, that was really beneficial for us to learn is, and those of you that take care of congenital patients know this, that they're, they're kind of in this weird group, like they're willing to take chances. And when you talk to them about like end of life or risk, the parents and the patients are like, yeah, yeah, they told us that we were, we were going to die. We never were going to make it. So just go ahead, give it to us. So, um, but we did learn from them, like, you know, a lot of our, as we were growing this program, a lot of our physicians and nurses were concerned like, are we doing the right thing? Like, are we hurting people? And, and Nancy Stewart, his mom, was really pretty vocal about the fact that he wouldn't have survived without this. And so they were willing to try it. And I think we found this with a lot of our patients. So this, this sort of incent incentivized is probably the wrong word, but energized us to keep going and try to figure it out what we we're going to do. So we went back and said, okay, we got to rethink how we're doing this. So the first thing is we got we to gotta identify the patients and figure out how are we going to risk stratify them because <clears throat> they're not all created equal. And so we looked at... How, how to lump them in groups of complex congenital patients. Um, tetralogy of Fallot, so two ventricle patients sort of on the left, as you move up the risk categories from systemic right ventricles that are still two ventricles all the way on up to Fontans with single ventricle. If I had to redo this, I would include Shones, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that, but I think that is like so far northeast um, that we're unaccounting for that, that group in general. But, and then we said, all right, now we got to also think about how are we accounting for all the risks that go that, that these patients face prior to transplant? Cause you know, are we getting all the signs? Are we treating all the things we can treat to make them as good of a candidate for transplant as we possibly can? So the, identifying the risk was key. And then we sort of looked at it and said, and Joanne Linnefeld was key to this, said, okay, so we have all these patients that need, and this is this is all that would fit on this slide, but we all know how many different teams that these patients have to see. And we formed this group, the uh, Advanced Congenital Cardiac Therapies Group, which is essentially within our transplant group. And it's, um, I function with one or two nurses and, and um, uh, nurse practitioners as like the almost like the pit crew. So someone's got to coordinate care for all of these people and yell at all of the, the teams to see them and discuss them. Because when we were doing things sort of, you know, in different silos, it wasn't working. So then how do we be prepared? And we, um, uh, I like to, I love Austin Powers. I don't know if you guys are fans, but the, um, when we looked at, we said, all right, we got to be prepared because it seems like we're getting to, to these patients too late. And what was, was interesting was this was a really nicely done paper that we got to write about that it's interesting that so many pediatric cardiologists don't think that they know that the Fontans specifically are going to die from heart failure at some point, but they don't think that they need to see a heart failure doctor, which is a little bit crazy, right? Like, you know, it's coming. Why wouldn't we send them? And I think on the adult side, to be honest, in a lot of centers, that's also the case where people get sent really, really late. And then there's this idea of, of just pure panic. And I think that, I think we need to just stop panicking when you think about the fact like the steamroller is coming, you just got to know how fast it is and how far away it is. Like the, just try to be a little bit prepared. So James, James really helped us sort of think about all of this. And then our next heart liver went way better. This is Sean, um, uh, I love showing this picture cause he's kind of a whack job. And, um, He's, he celebrated his 30th birthday and had a heart and liver put on his um, cake. Um, but we learned from that, that sort of uh, got the program sort of going the right direction because we used all the things we had done with James where we were like, you know, he's too sick, he's too frail, his PLE's too bad, he's nutritionally malnourished. 
and improved that with Sean so that he did quite well. And he's, I think, five years out now. So one of the things that we've done that has really helped to prevent the fall a lot is we've really leaned on the use of CPET. Um, uh, I'm not an expert like Yoni, but I know that this is, I mean, the, the Boston group has done a lot of work. And what we've seen is, is that changes in VO2 probably are the best predictor. Now, the, the question is, if, if it's the change just in VO2, we focus a lot on also time on the treadmill. And so, you know, when the patients say they feel fine and they only, they did, you know, 10 minutes on a Naughton protocol and you bring them back six months later and they're only doing five minutes, that's a big change and tells you that they're not doing well. So we do a lot of CPET because also this is Liz, um, who was just recently trans, no, no, she's over two years out now, actually, uh, transplanted, whose goal was pretty much just to say, uh, I want to be able to climb and hike. And after her transplant, she told us, she was like, you know, it was really amazing. I went, I went trick-or-treating with my nieces and they had trouble keeping up with me. I've never gone trick-or-treating before because, and everybody was like, oh my God, like we are completely underestimating what is normal for, for your exercise tolerance. So we probably put people on the treadmill every six to 12 months is pretty much protocol. If, if we think they're starting to slip, sometimes we'll even do it every three months. Um, we do have to, we try though to, to recognize and, and encourage people that, that CPET is not like the gatekeeper to transplant. So um, most of you probably know, like the peak VO2 numbers of 14 and 12 that were set by Donna Mancini's uh, paper back in the 90s about timing of transplant based on peak VO2 doesn't really apply to congenital patients. And so when we looked at this, when I was at Penn, of the 20 patients in about a seven year period that have been transplanted, only one of those patients would have met the actual criteria of less than 14 for transplant. And so um, we try to encourage people, you know, if you see worsening or you don't think they're doing well, then you should just please send them for evaluation. Because um, I think if you get a young person who's got a peak VO2 of, of 12, I mean, that's now we've, we've, and oftentimes we've missed the boat. We pay a lot of attention to arrhythmias, which I'm sure you guys do too. We're trying to get our EP guys to send them sooner because, you know, I don't know, I don't want to insult my EP friends, but like if, if ablation four didn't work, ablation five is probably not going to work either. So not that I don't want people to be ablated if we can, but sometimes we got to have, we got to go down parallel paths in order to say, if this doesn't work, what are our other options? And I and I bring this up because we had this really catastrophic loss of a of a Glenn patient um, who she had she had AFib. The only way for us to get her down to Vanderbilt was we had to ablate her up in the Northeast and then be, stabilize her and get her to come down. And she actually had in the, during transplant the atrial cuff that is the only thing from the old heart that that connects to the new heart, and she developed a fistula there and then had. Uh, uh, aorta esophageal fistula and, and subsequently died about 10 days after transplant. So now we're, anytime we see someone with arrhythmia, we're all alerted even more that, you know, SVTs and VTs are really uh, markers of badness. And I think, I think we're, we try to encourage people to, um, um, to think think about advanced therapies before they're necessary and before you do something. And so this was a, an atrial switch patient um, who was transplanted and about one year before he was transplanted, he had SVC stenosis. And so he got a, uh, he got a stent of his superior limb and this almost caused catastrophic hemorrhage in the operating room at time of, at time of transplant, because as you see here, when it came out, it was all smashed. Um, the stent with with the leads when the leads came out it was sort of a disaster. And our surgeons are phenomenal and were able to rescue him. <clears throat> but the point is is that that was something like we should have we should have planned better in terms of just putting a stent in. I'm not saying anyone we want anyone walking around with SVC stenosis or um, or, or thrombosis. But if we're going again, we got to think think about what the implications are for every procedure we're doing. We try to use some of the labs, although at this point, I'm not sure exactly how to use them other than, and this was Sasha and, and Dr. Landsberg published this on using a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. 
you know, by the time the patients are getting sent to us, we see that they're, that they're inflamed. And I don't really know specifically what numbers to focus on, but I think what we're seeing is that as they start to get worse, high sensitivity CRP goes up. And then of course we, <clears throat> this also came out of uh, Boston was the use of MELD XI, which is a combination of um, liver disease and kidney disease, which is has been shown to be a marker of, of worsening. I mean, it's not really surprising, right? So if you, anytime you see someone with their kidneys are getting worse and their liver is getting worse, then their, their risk is, is going down. It's interesting that um, they actually did like a follow-up paper to this. And they, when they re-looked at the data and they didn't find the same numbers or the same criteria here, what they had shown was that, like if your MELD XI is greater than 18, about 25% of those patients need a, need a transplant um, or uh, die from sudden death or heart failure death within one year. I don't think in the second time they looked at all of this data in subsets, it didn't pan out the same way, but I think it, it, it does tell the story though, right? That if patients ha are having worse end organ function, their risks are going up. And then PLE is where another thing that we didn't take, do very well on in, take, in terms of taking care of James. So for those of you that don't take care of all this congenital patients, protein losing enteropathy is when the patients lose, they essentially lose their, um, their protein through their gut. And as a result, they have uh, a ton of ascites. They developed uh, pleural effusions, but they also are at high risk for infections because they're losing their immunoglobulin. So they're at high risk for infections and they're also malnourished. Right, so all of these things are not great markers for um, doing well with transplant. Kurt Schumacher and a, and a host of the pediatric uh, cohort looked at this, and uh, this was a really, really well done study. And they found in kids that if you transplanted Fontans with PLE, the PLE did not predict worsening and did not predict poor outcome. I think it had slightly uh, longer time in ICU, but there was no difference in outcome. But I, I caution you to think about what, who we're actually talking about. And I talked to Kurt about this for a while. I mean, they're looking at kids. In, in our patients, we're looking at patients that are 40 years old, 40 years of PLE and, and being malnourished. I mean, going into transplant with an albumin of two is never, is never ideal. So we were trying to figure out, you know, what should we be doing for these patients? And Wendy Book, um, Wendy Book for years has been putting people on Midadrin for PLE. So I think it was Kurt um, at, in the University of Michigan group at, um, at ISHLT a few years ago talked about putting these patients with PLE on dopamine and because of the alpha receptors on the lymphatic channels, they were seeing an improvement in um, they were seeing an improvement in PLE. So albumin was going up, and patients were getting. I mean, they were just doing better. So Wendy had looked at this and said, you know, also we've been doing this, but we've been doing it with midodrin, which is a PO medication, which is way better than putting in a pick line. So we put together a few of our patients, and what we found was. And it doesn't work for everybody, but in these four patients, so these were four patients that were either being evaluated for transplant or going to be, or were listed for transplant. Those that were listed, there were some that we were able to improve um, their albumin, their nutrition, and their lymphocyte counts in ways that they were feeling so much better that we took them off the transplant list. And then one of the patients, I think it was, and two of the patients were being evaluated for transplant for PLE on Midadrin, the PLE got better, so we're now kicking the can down the road. So what does this mean? I don't think, I don't think Midadrin is, it doesn't work in everybody. I don't, and I can't tell you why it works in certain people and doesn't work in others. I also don't know what the perfect dose is. I, I think some of our patients have wound up being on 20 TID and some of them go on five and feel phenomenal. I think there's two real benefits though in these patients. Some, it's ideal if we can say, okay, we're not, um, we're going to make you feel better and we're going to, um, and we're going to kick this can down the road. I mean, the truth is the Fontans are still going to come back and need transplant, but it's better for them to need transplant at 45 than 40. Um, and then even in some of our patients, what we've seen is, um, when we've put them on Midadrin, 
their ascites improves and their pleural effusions improve, which just makes them better candidates for transplant and their albumins come up. So even if they still need transplant, we're sending in a patient now that looks and feels better and their ability to rehab post-transplant is better. We're kind of excited to see to see this, that it, we're now on line two, hopefully metadrin will make its way up. But I mean, what you'll see is in terms of the treatments for PLE, I mean, a lot of it is kind of magical. Um, the, I mean, we know that Lasix and diuretics, I'm, I'm still not convinced I know how heparin products work. Um, budesonide does seem to have some benefit, but the patients really hate being on budesonide. And then we got pretty aggressive about just saying, you know, we know all these heart failure medications work in two ventricle non-congenital patients. Why aren't we being more aggressive in doing it with congenital patients? Um, and this was a really nice study with about 20 patients where they put, they put uh, systemic right ventricle patients on Entresto. And what they saw was that their pro-BMPs came down their six minute walk came, uh, came up. And then interestingly, their cognitive function and their sleep improved, which I think was the most fascinating part. My guess, and I can't prove this, my guess is that we've improved their cardiac output. So their cognitive, they're getting more oxygen to the squash and they're, they're sleeping because they're probably drier. I'm, their wedge has probably gone down and now they're not suffocating. So we are, um, we are putting all of our systemic ventricles, if their blood pressures will tolerate it, on Entresto. We, um, we've had three patients so far that got started on Entresto that we then delisted because they were feeling so much better. There's something that um, Lynn Stevenson and Joanne Lindenfeld have talked about, that for, there's these, this idea of a super responder to Entresto. I don't know why certain people just do so well. It does seem, though, that our young patients, even with small doses of Entresto, if they're gonna respond, they respond robustly and very quickly. And then the next thing to look at is SGLT2, so DAPA and EMPA. And I, I would argue there's legitimately no reason not to use these in all of our congenital patients, uh, other than why we wouldn't use them in our non-congenital patients. And then CardioMEMS, Kurt Schumacher and, and uh, Alyssa Bradley did this first, and then we uh, at, uh, at Ohio State, and then we've done it, I mean, it's a, now it's a little bit easier to get it approved because of the, the BNP. Um, you can use BNP as a way to get it approved by insurance. But the truth is, CardioMEMS keeps people out of the hospital and makes them feel better. There's no reason we can't do it in more of these patients. I do want to just say that it's easier to say do it in all the patients. I think that, that the Fontans is a whole sort of different group that needs to be thought about carefully. I'm not saying we can't use – we're using SGLT2s in all those patients – in Tresto, you have to be just a little bit more careful because of what it can do to their blood pressure. And then we said, okay, we got to stop some of these ACHD myths. So, um, and how we're going to use research. So let me just tell you what my definition of ACHD myths are. So these are statements about patients that are based upon what has been done previously. And then to be really a true ACHD myth, it cannot be based on any data. It must be said loudly and definitively from a podium and no time is given to dispute the claim. So you just get up there, you just say what you think and you run off the stage, which unfortunately we've, we've done some of that in ACHD. So I think this is sort of where my research um, interest uh, sort of took off. I think this is some of me having grown up in New York and then done some banking. I like to be a little bit of a jerk sometimes. So I was like, all right, I'm going to start my research by looking at all the things that I'm not sure are right or if they make sense. So one of the things that we did was when we had this patient at, at Penn, there used to be a huge number of patients that had uh, pulmonary hypertension that and they're congenital. So they need a heart lung. And that's what we have to do. And that's not a small undertaking. So this was a patient that had a systemic right ventricle that was at Penn. And we just said, you know, let's just treat him like everybody else that we would treat. Let's forget about the fact that it's right ventricle is, is the pumping chamber. And we put him on nipride and dobutamine. So when he initially started, he came in in full-blown shock, right? His wedge is 33. Um, his PA pressures are really elevated. And his cardiac output and index are really low. So it seems like he does have pulmonary hypertension, right? But is it truly 
irreversible type one pulmonary hypertension, or is this as a result of him having really high filling pressures for long periods of time? And the first thought was, well, it's congenital, so it's got to be pulmonary hypertension needs heart lung. But the truth is, is that the the groups in, in Europe have showed this, that almost all of these patients have reversible pulmonary hypertension. So we said, okay, let's, let's try and see if we can treat him that way. And so we put him on nipride and dobutamine, and within 37 days, uh, which is a long time, uh, his, he was now reversible um, and was successfully transplanted. Now, the next thing you could say, is, all right, so, so then we were like, okay, so maybe not everybody, not all these patients need heart lungs. You could have just said, well, okay, that patient, why don't you just put a VAD in him? Like, that would be the simplest thing to do. Just put a VAD in him, rehab him, and drop his pressures. There wasn't much surgical interest in doing that in the patient, but we, that's where I would have leaned. But anyway, we did prove that medicines work, um, and he, yeah, so he did pretty well. But we had similar patients at Vanderbilt that we, this was the first time a heart may three was done in a systemic uh, right ventricle patient. Um, and we did the, this method of, we put in a VAD, gave her time to rehab, put her on sildenafil because she did have some component of who group one pulmonary hypertension. Um, and then she was successfully transplanted. We've got, this was almost three years ago. No, it's over three years now, almost four years. We have this new thing. I don't know what's going on with our patients, but they all are getting these humongous tattoos to celebrate transplant. Um, so they were like, well, you know, you gave it, you're doing hepatitis C hearts. So we're getting tattoos. I, like, I guess you're right. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, it's tough to argue. Um, and we did the same thing with this gentleman who unfortunately had been in a hospital for an outside hospital waiting for over six months. And so we vatted him for, he had a vat for a year and then he was transplanted. I'm going to talk briefly about pulmonary hypertension and Shones, and I've decided that Shones is the worst. Like every everyone who's involved in congenital heart disease has like, this is really nerdy, but everybody has like their favorite lesion and then the thing that they hate the most. And I really like congenitally corrected or LTGA. That's right, isn't it? What's your favorite? Okay, I, I hate Shones, so. And the reason I can't uh, I worry about Shones, and we're we're working on publishing. If you guys have cases, we'd love to work with you guys too. Is that we we're, with Stanford and Duke, we have about ten different patients. That there's this idea that Shones is it's just valvular disease, and they'll they do fine. And what ends up happening is everyone sort of falls asleep, and they keep operating on these patients, and then they do develop this real deal pulmonary hypertension. So we just had a woman. She was unfortunately was a nurse who had Shones had mitral valve disease. So they put this like chimney graft all the way up into her atrium. I don't know if you can see it as well, but that's essentially like the, so she had about this much atrium left. So she and had blockages of her pulmonary veins. So started to develop pulmonary hypertension. So by the time she came to us, we, we decided, and we talked to experts around the country, Paul Forfia, and we talked to Ryan Tedford about what do we think our risks are? And we decided we would transplant her and now she's doing really well. We transplanted her and kept her on ECMO for about a week to make sure that her pulmonary pressures come down. But there, that was another example of a patient like we could have a year prior before we tried to muck around with her mitral valve, um, we should have been more thoughtful about maybe we just need to go to transplant and treat her pulmonary hypertension. And then we had this patient, Rafi on the left, um, who... He also, he had pulmonary hypertension and then developed bad liver cirrhosis. So he was a combined heart liver as a Shones patient, which is, is quite an undertaking. This guy had a cardiomems. We kept him in the hospital and like to keep him dry, he was required because of his restrictive physiology. He required being on a Lasix trip the whole time he was in the hospital. He actually, this is kind of cool. He got, he got engaged on the day that he got discharged. So, uh. He'd been in the hospital waiting and then post-transplant for almost six months. All right, let's talk about another, a few more ACHD myths. And um, one is this idea that we need to oversize the donors. Um, that Their idea that this pulmonary hypertension is irreversible and we can't account for it. And so we need to put in bigger hearts. So the problem is, is that when you wait, I don't think it's a bad thing as long as the heart will fit, except when you're trying to up, always upsize hearts, you have to, you're passing on a lot of different hearts. 
And so we, uh, Dan Clark, who's now at Stanford, looked at this in the UNOS database, and it turns out we know that undersizing and putting small hearts in bigger people doesn't work. Okay. But what we found was is that when we looked at height, weight, BMI, LV mass, uh, predicted heart mass, there was no benefit in, in oversizing donors. There was no difference in outcomes. So we've sort of said, we're going to make our choices for these patients based on the same data we do for all of the patients. So, um, which again is, you know, it's a little bit of hand waving, but, you know, taking a, a little bit of a smaller donor with a very short ischemic time is better than taking an oversized donor with a very long ischemic time. Um, in the, so we try to, but we're trying to make the same decisions for our congenital patients that we're making for everybody else. And then there's this idea that they need extra parts. This, this is never easy for me to try to explain, but so with the Fontans, right, on the right, they've had work done on their pulmonary arteries. So there's this idea that, you know, they have to, the pulmonary arteries have to be reconstructed, which makes sense. And usually when we, when a transplant is done by the surgeons, the pulmonary trunk is, is transected. And there's this idea that, well, what we should do is if we know that we're going to need to rebuild and reconstruct pulmonary arteries, we should get the pulmonary arteries and transect them all the way out into the lungs. And so the way, the best way to get long pulmonary arteries is you have to go and take, um, get the heart and the lung. So it's a lung that's been, is not being used by another recipient. Oftentimes it's, it's, um, I mean, this has happened recently with COVID lungs where we've taken COVID, a COVID positive patient, their heart, but not, and the lungs haven't been used. So, I mean, it seems reasonable. And I think it seems to me like from a surgical standpoint, it's, it's easier. Um, and, uh, and it must be true. And I can tell you that that must be true because I know that wait list times are increasing. The need for lung donors to enable vascular reconstruction is necessary in some recipients. And the reason I know this is true because I said this. And so it must be true. And then Boston and Marie Valente and Michael Giverts, they also said it. So it's definitely true now. If Boston said it, it's definitely true. It turns out it's not true. So when we looked at this, uh, Michael Diamond, um, who's now in Canada, looked at this. And what we found was there was no difference in outcomes um, if we looked at using, uh, getting the heart lung as a block and doing no PA reconstruction versus doing PA reconstruction. Again, if we have the option of getting all of the PAs, we take it. But again, it, it increases your risk uh, or your time in the hospital and time waiting. And these patients don't have a humongous amount of time. And then I think it goes to the idea of the, the ACHD myths that all Fontans are, are the same and we know what we're doing, because I assure you we don't. So I published this with the group at Penn when I was a fellow, and, and we essentially said that all our single ventricles that have stage three or stage four um, fibrosis, they all need um, combined heart, uh, heart and liver, and that's the right thing to do. This was a really nice, um, nicely done. Matt Lewis uh, from Columbia led this in the Foster study. You guys were involved. We, I mean, centers from around the country, and this, this at least makes a suggestion that these patients all do better with heart livers. Um, I'm not sold, and I can tell you a little bit more about that in just a second, but on the flip side, we have the pediatric folks, Kathleen Simpson, who said that they don't, they don't need dual organ. They all do fine with just heart alone. But the problem, one of the problems is when we've looked at Fontans and heart livers is it depends on how we're defining cirrhosis. So these patients of the seven that were defined as liver cirrhosis, only two of those had biopsy-proven cirrhosis. And then you also see that there's a number of patients that had cirrhosis sort of peppered through that, that died or whatever. So I don't think you can say that they don't, they do need, or they don't need. Um, I think the answer is sometimes they need. And one of the things that our liver team did was they looked at the biopsies and they compared them to our, our explanted livers and it doesn't always match. And sometimes it's way worse and sometimes it's better. So I think the answer is, um, I think the answer is somewhere in the middle that we need to evaluate all of these different patients in different ways to figure out if they actually need heart and liver. Our, we lean heavily on our liver team. I mean, I don't make those decisions. What they've sort of said is if they have 
So they look at a number of different things. So they look at, of course, cirrhosis by biopsy. They focus a lot on varices and um, uh, any sort of fistulas or like umbilical recannulization of the, the umbilical veins and what's going on in the belly. Because usually if there's a lot of collaterals, they usually think that the cirrhosis is way worse. And so far this method has worked. Um, I don't necessarily think that heart liver, uh, and now I'm disagreeing with my own ACHD myth. I don't think that heart liver always is the best plan because I think we're getting patients that are too sick. One of the things that we've tried to do now is I'm trying to see if we can push towards doing more heart alone um, or do heart liver when the liver is a little bit on the early side, recognizing some of, we don't know what the risks are, but the problem is when we take these really sick Fontans in for heart liver, I mean, I mean, just taking them for any operation, right? I mean, we, if they all go get their wisdom teeth out, we all panic. So like heart liver in a, in a Fontan with cirrhosis is really challenging. This idea of liver preventing rejection, I thought was baloney until last night at dinner. And now I'm like, I got to learn more about this because uh, it sounds like you guys have um, done it differently. This paper that came out of Mayo, I'll tell you what didn't make, what didn't make sense to us and why we didn't really buy it was that... Um, these patients were not, they were highly sensitized, but they were not C1Q positive. Um, and they got so much immunosuppression up front that it was like, it didn't seem possible that they could ever reject. And we looked at their level of antibodies, so their MFIs, and they were in the paper, and they were way lower than what like our cutoff would be calling them highly sensitized. But I'm going to learn more today because now I may change my whole plan based on what I learned at dinner because it sounds like there's something magical going on in livers in Washington. Um, but I mean, I think this is a, I think this is a real deal plan for some of these patients that are sensitized. I also think that the way you guys have done it here is phenomenal in that starting doing the highly sensitized patients heart before liver in non congenital patients because you then take all the risk you take a lot of the surgical risk out of it that goes along with just doing a congenital on its own. Because I have to say, when we looked at this Mayo paper, one of the things we thought about was, you know, it's not benign. This is Camille on the right, who within one year, he was highly sensitized. So he got desensitization and then got, with transplant, got um, uh, a couple rounds of thymo. And he de developed a malignancy within 12 months, which is the earliest I had actually ever seen it. But um, it's not, I mean, it does happen. The other thing is um, that one of our fellows is finishing up the manuscript on is, is we have seen these patients reject. And in our Fontan experience, uh, heart livers, about three or four of the, I think in the paper it was 11, have some level of rejection. So I don't think, I don't think it mitigates all the risk. I think you still have to pay attention to the fact that they're at risk for, for, um, for rejection. And then I think th this is a newer view of mine, which I, I may be way off on, but we, I never really paid that much attention to age. Like you see the patients seem to look good and they feel good and they're exercising. So this on the right was Mr. Stride. He was almost 60 years old as a Fontan. He did great with heart liver. He's like three years out and just figured, okay, he's just like everybody else. We risk stratified him, just creatinine, all the things I told you about. And then, um, Sean, so I show this picture because it just makes me laugh, but he's the second one from the right. He's not the one smoking. But uh, uh, Sean was a regular dude, and we just sort of bought into the fact that he was doing well and he was having fun and whatever, and then he was approaching 50 when he sort of failed, and we and he did terrible with transplant, He and he ended up dying after a prolonged hospitalization. And when I look back, and we again – like to say we're experts is a gross exaggeration. I mean, we've done like 15 of these, but the, when we look at our Fontans, those that sort of get over right around 50 and over, um, they seem to do way worse with combined heart liver. Now I just turned 46. So that number may keep going up as I get closer to the number that I'm saying, but that's where it sort of feels like we're, we're struggling. When the, the whole idea that, that it was this idea that also in 2018 that, well, the listing, you know, everyone's out to get our ACHD patients. We can't get them transplanted. And we went from this 
three tiered system to now six tiered system where all the congenitals are lumped into status four. And there was this idea that I think a lot of people in the ACHD community were sort of up in arms. Like this isn't fair. Look, you're putting them down lower and whatever. And what we found is, and I talked to Joe Rogers, who is now at, in Texas, but was a Duke at the time who had developed a lot of this. And he just said, look, we don't understand your patients. Like it doesn't, these people don't make any sense and we don't know how to compare them one to another. So let's just write exceptions for them and explain uh, how, why they're so high risk. And interestingly, Ari Cedars led this and he looked and there was, with the new system, there's actually no difference in, in outcomes. And we're, we're having a little bit of an easier time getting some of these patients transplanted. And a lot of it is, is that we're using the exceptions. And so we're, what we're doing, the idea was initially that with this new system, we wouldn't have to write exceptions to get people upgraded on the list. But what we found is that you just have to explain why, for instance, a Fontan that needs heart liver that's on dopamine is at least equivalent to some, from a risk standpoint, is someone on a balloon pump. And um, so far, that's that's the method we've been doing in a lot of places around the country have been doing, and we haven't had any problems. I think people recognize that these are a high-risk group of individuals that we don't know how to risk stratify. And then there's this idea that, well, there's no hearts, you know, so we what are we doing? And we, but we need to be very sensitive and careful about what we're doing for these patients. So we at Vanderbilt started before I got there using hepatitis C hearts, which has now become a lot of the standard of care in terms of donors. And everybody said, well, we shouldn't really be, you know, we can't do that in congenital patients, especially the Fontans. And we did it in, in one and it went great. So we then did it in a combined heart liver uh, hepatitis C and she did great um, with hepatitis C organs because we treat the hepatitis C and they haven't had any um, long sequelae. The next thing that we started doing was using DCD and NRP hearts in our congenital patients. And this we just published with um, uh, with the group at Duke, but I think there's, I don't know, there's 10 or 12 in the, in the study, but it's uh, hep C and DCD patients and they do well. And I think part of what I'm saying is like, we should just treat them like everybody else, like stop making reasons why we can't transplant them or shouldn't transplant. And then lastly, um, I want to just sort of change because I think it's important, um, especially for, I don't know, I guess maybe for all of us to stop and think about what we're doing and the impact we have. Um, I don't know how this region feels about Tim Tebow, but uh, for those of you that don't know, that's Tim Tebow, who was a Heisman Trophy winner, played professional football. But what is amazing about Tim Tebow is he's, he's really um, done a lot for the Down syndrome community and to support congenital heart disease as an offshoot of, of that. And so I went to this amazing talk where he, he was giving a talk and what he does is every year he donates his Heisman trophy. So people pay like, it's kind of crazy, but thousands of dollars, like $50,000, $100,000 to have his Heisman trophy in their house for six months. And, and the first thing you're like, that's nuts. Who cares that much? But so he gives this whole talk though. And he says that the reason he does that is that, um, and this was at the Brett Boyer foundation, which is, a it's a foundation focused on congenital heart research. That's in Franklin, Tennessee. And he says, the reason he does that is because there's definitely going to be some people that just want to say, like, I touched the Heisman trophy, but he said he does that because his goal is that every time someone comes into that house and says, what is that? That's the Heisman trophy. Why do you have it? Well, I, I donated money to congenital heart disease. And let me tell you about congenital heart disease and how it helps to, to build um, uh, the, how they're building research projects and supporting education. And so he said this, he said, I don't want to be someone whose life is fo focused on success because success is about me, but significance is about other people. So we can take our success and turn it into significance. And I think sometimes we have to stop and think about where are we and what have we actually done? And I think I think we've, I'll show you what we've done at Vanderbilt so far. So in the last five years, we've grown fairly significant. We, we've now transplanted 44 patients and six of those have undergone VAD. Um, and for the ACHD people, I know you want to see the specifics of, of the lesions. The miscellaneous is mainly shown. Um, so we've, you know, I guess numbers alone have been, I don't guess, sort of successful um, we've had some success with the research, but one of the things that 
Joanne has been focused on is that, and why we think this has been significant, is not just getting publications out there for publication's sake, but actually trying to move the needle and also collaborating with a whole bunch of different places around the country. And I've, um, she was really right that the easiest way to build teams in, well, not, not the only way, but one of the great ways to build teams in, in medicine is to use research as a tool to collaborate on projects. And so numbers and stuff are, are great, but I just tell you a few patient stories that I think sort of summarize where we are and, and um, the, the significance of what we're all doing. I mean, we're doing it, and I think you guys are doing it here, and it's being done around the country. This was Pete Hutlinger, who um, he was in L transposition, so a system systemic right ventricle patient that was unable to get transplanted at Vanderbilt um, years back. He he ended up going to Texas to get a VAD um, and then subsequently died in 2016. And what's amazing is that this is now Mrs. Gomiller who had exactly the same, the same anatomy as Pete did. And about 10 years later, uh, sorry, not 10 years later, about five years later, we were able to successfully transplant her using sort of the the methods we had thought about and also our surgeons had done more and more cases and now felt comfortable sort of undertaking this. She also is really into motorcycle riding, which drives me crazy, but uh, she, she at least, her husband rides the two wheels and she's in three. She convinced me that that's a good idea. Um, and then this was Joe Idle. Um, he's on the top in the middle. So this was, this was a Down syndrome kiddo. Oh, he's not a kiddo. He just turned 40. But um, Down syndrome, who had AV canal that would end up being a Fontan, who came to us with no other options. And, you know, we just said, all right, let's give it a shot. And we he underwent a combined, um, combined heart liver, and he's over two years out now. We learned a lot about how to take care of, I mean, the, the, the pediatric component of that was a, quite a battle in terms of dealing with um, the patients and families of that sort of intellect level and, and age and uh, made us rethink how we have to think about social work and case management and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, he's now was successfully transplanted and was actually featured at the Super Bowl because he's become quite good friends with Brandon Graham. Um, so uh, yeah, he's done well. And then lastly, I'll tell you about this. We have a bunch of funny patients. I think those of you that take care of congenital patients know that these are very quirky, funny people. So at one point, so these four patients sort of overlapped. They're all Fontans except for Rafi, who's the Shones. They all sort of overlapped in the hospital at around the same time, and they became really good friends. And like when they come back, they stayed each other's houses and all this stuff. And uh, so after they got, they all got to their one year, they they made this poster for me and it said, uh, or this um, picture and said, greetings from Camp Menachem of 2021. So to conclude, in terms of changing the wild rumpus uh, in honor of Dr. Krieger, I'd just like to say that the keys are, uh, at least in my mind, are identifying the, the worsening early and, and working as a team and collaborating together. I think we're at the point where we got to just stop saying stuff and start demanding data and just not, not be okay with um, just hearing people say stuff on the podium. And then we have to try and just, you know, be courageous enough to try new and unproven technologies that we know are safe in other populations. And then I think it's always important just to stop and think for one second about the impact of what we're actually doing. It's very easy to get caught up in the grind of, clinic and all the emails we get, but um, we are getting uh, to make a difference in the lives of these patients. And with that, I'll end and open it up to any questions anybody may have. Thanks so much, Jonathan. That was, that was really fantastic. Um, we see this cycle over and over of um, centers saying, man, congenital transplant is really high risk. We better leave it to someone else and then watching someone else do it and say, oh, we should really get into this and then do it and do it badly and then realize, oh, wait, you know, if we're going to do this, we need to figure out how to do it well. And then 
you know, you describe your center having gone through that. And I think that's uh, incredibly common, but it's a dangerous, it's a dangerous cycle to start over at each center that wants to get into this game. How do we homogenize the strategy nationally for transplanting high-risk congenital heart disease patients and take what was learned the hard way at these big centers and create national standards for when, how, and who should transplant these patients? I don't know all the answers to that. I think I don't think every center should do it. Okay. So I think I think it has to be big centers and I think that ACHD has to be involved, right? You guys showed that. So I think that's two of the things. I think you you also have to have institution bias that if the first three go poorly, we're not shutting everything down. And I think we have to recognize that it's not always going to go incredibly well right off the start. But I also think that it depends on how you start. And one of the things that we, when I look back, that I definitely did wrong was we should not have started trying to ramp up our congenital transplants with a failing Fontan heart liver. I should have found a tetralogy patient out there and been like, okay, this is going to be the first patient and get people excited about it. Because one of the problems that we face, and we just saw this, we just listed, for instance, a heart, um, we just listed a heart liver at yesterday who is a Ristelli. So he's a two ventricle patient who has liver disease. And I had to talk multiple times to the to the surgical team and just say, guys, his risk is, it's high because it's a heart liver, but it's way different than the Fontan. And it's a different patient. They're like, oh, he's not a Fontan. Yeah, yeah, not everybody's a Fontan. So the I think we have to figure out also how to convince people that congenital is not the diagnosis, right? All of the, there's different risks within. Um, and then I do think that a lot of it is just getting surgical buy-in and getting them all to work together really well. And I, we, our most complex are always done by a congenital surgeon and an adult transplant surgeon. Um, it's not always perfect, but um, that's what we've been trying to do. And I think, you know, why not have the expertise of both people involved? Thank you for the wonderful talk. And I also appreciate the shout out to Dan Clark, who's an amazing um, person and, and doctor. Um, you know, one thing I was wondering, you know, as uh, we're learning more about transplanting um, patients with congenital heart disease, I um, imagine more of them will, will probably continue to get transplants, but there's gonna be many who aren't able to because there are only so many hearts. And you talked about um, treatment with mitodrine for patients with PLE. Mm -hmm and the uh, beneficial effects of Entresto. So I'm wondering, has anyone looked into um, the effects, the benefits of mental health counseling in helping patients um, with ACHD on the heart transplant list live better? Because we know that there's data in patients with cancer. It's a huge and, problem. Uh, hospice, the, so. you, I mean, your, your point is incredibly well taken. Please do that. I mean, the we all struggle with this, right? I mean, we have a huge transplant program and we have one and a half full-time therapists and we have two social workers our our achd team finally got a social worker and yeah we, it is a big problem one of the things that we've seen which is kind of scary is that so our one-year outcomes for transplant have been pretty good for congenital patients and then our one to three year outcomes start to fall off so that's when they start they're now young right and they they're young and they feel good and they stop taking their meds and they start doing some of the things they're not supposed to. And then we've seen some bad outcomes that way. So I, I mean, I think mental health in this country is just a disaster to be perfectly honest, but uh, yes, we need way more involvement of the mental health community in taking care of these patients because the truth is, is that oftentimes when they come into the room and I, they, as soon as they see my jacket says transplant, 50% start crying. And I'm like, how did you not know what you're doing here? Like, <laughs> this, what, what did you think was going to, we were going to talk about? Um, yeah, it's a major problem. If you have an idea and want to figure out how we all do this and work together, uh, we would definitely be in. Dr. Stout. Lovely talk. Um, and captures so much of everything. And I can ask you a bazillion questions, but I'm going to go back to the which lesions do you like, not like? And I think fundamentally, the ones that I like 
are, if they, if people start doing poorly, are the ones that look most like standard heart failure because that's got that, you know, we kind of know what path mm-hmm. we're going down. So specifically systolic dysfunction, whatever ventricle. Yeah. Um, but what I don't like about Shones is the same thing I don't like about truncus arteriosus that I don't like if you've got a Restelli in there with liver disease, restrictive physiology. Uh-huh. The mustard and sending repairs that have restrictive atrial physiology, which is probably why that pH is actually reversible over time, is that it has more of a, you know, that that feature to it. How do you factor all of this into assessing risk? Because I feel like that, like in some ways, it may be as simple as their exercise capacity went down. Their hemodynamics aren't terrible. Start going down that path because you ain't got nothing you're going to do about restriction. Or are there some of these medications that might actually have a beneficial impact in your mind, et cetera? Yeah. So the re- the restriction is brutal, right? Like this is, it's a, it's a big problem that we deal with. We sort of go down this parallel path. And one of the things that we've been trying to do, and Ben Frischertz and Angela Weingarten, who are on our ACHD side, are really, really good about sending people early and we'll, we'll, um, we'll sort of uh, co-manage as we start to see slipping. So usually it's when we, so we try the meds if we can, right? We see if there's other things that we can fix easily. We do CPET and then, and oftentimes we'll even open the transplant evaluation sooner. And sometimes they get turned down and we say, okay, they're too well. And then I'll see them every six months and Angela and Ben will see them every six months. We sort of alternate to try to look for any sign of slipping. Now, what's the definition of slipping, which is, is, and I think some of it is if we're all the things we see in other restrictive diseases, right? If we can't, if we, we can't keep volume off of them, if they keep getting hospitalized, um, if their CPETs are getting worse, any evidence of end organ dysfunction, then we sort of pull the trigger and say, Let's move forward. Now, there are definitely some people that would say, well, you're maybe we're doing this too early, right? Like, let's keep kicking this can down the road and see what happens. The problem is, though, it's all about the steamroller, right? So we there is a point where we're getting close to the, the steamroller and we're, we, we miss the window. So I think the idea of being, we're not going to know if we're too early, but it seems to me like if, if we have diuretic, if we have diuretic resistance and we're starting to see kidney dysfunction, it's probably time to at least start watching closely and think about evaluation. Does that sort of answer your question? Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us for Grand Rounds. That was uh, a great talk and it's inspiring to see what you guys are doing down there. Uh, he'll be doing tutorial with the fellows and then again, another plug for the round table this afternoon from one to three. Uh, in person or on Zoom. So thanks so much. Yeah.